Good morning. If you have your Bibles open to Psalm 106, we are talking about God's work and his works uh, from Psalm 102 to 107. That's the general theme of those psalms to really bring God's people into a specific meditation on that word and those ideas. And so we've been talking about all that God has done, all of his deeds and his work, and we've talked about creation, we've, we've talked about Israel, we've talked uh, about his, his specific relationship with a group of people and how he handles that and what he does and how faithful he is to continue to work. Today, we're going to talk about what happens when we forget about this work, when we fail to meditate on it, what happens when we lose sight of God's work. That's what Psalm 106 does. It's going to confront you with sin uh, and help you to see uh, the sinfulness of your ways and of your heart. And it does it kindly, and we're going to do this kindly as as much as possible, but we also uh, need to take our sin seriously. And we need to be ready to repent as this psalm leads us in that activity. And so today... uh, my goal is to not produce a bunch of shame and, and produce uh, and have you walk out of here feeling incredibly low. The goal of Psalm 106 is actually to, to encourage you and, and to show you how precious a meeting with the Lord is. And that no matter what your circumstance and situation and condition is, He is ready to meet with you. And do mighty things in your life. And do mighty things in your heart. And so uh, I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to all that God is going to do in, in this psalm. It is a, a well-intentioned, beautifully structured psalm. I just want to point that out. that This wasn't just written spur of the moment, just line by line. But the author thought it through and is intentional in his design to help us be aware of that reality. That while we tend to focus heavily on our sin, that there's other things going on. As we reflect and rehearse the mistakes of us and our past, it moves us to crying out to the Lord and to ultimately praising his name. And so the psalm has kind of a mirror image. Uh, It opens with the phrase, praise the Lord, which is the Hebrew word hallelujah that we just sung in that last song, which means to excitedly praise the Lord, to excitedly boast about his name. And so that is the first couple verses and that's how the psalm ends in the same phrase. And then right after that uh, is a cry to Yahweh and then you get this massive section in the middle, uh, 40 verses, talking about the stories of Israel's past, focusing mainly on that generation that came out of Egypt and wandered around the desert. And uh, then it takes us back to a cry and to praise. Uh, And so let's dive right in. Verse 1, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. There's always reasons to praise the Lord and we can always praise him for his goodness and steadfast love enduring forever. It's not just that he loves, but his love endures. It it uh, outpaces everything else. When all is said and done in eternity, everything else will fade away, but God's love is what stays the course. Who can utter the mighty deeds of Yahweh or declare his praise? As Jeff just pointed out, that's a rhetorical question. It's meant to say, who can adequately describe the praise of the Lord? As if, if we just, just think about God's works and his, his deeds that he's done in your life, it's hard to describe how he's moved you to be where you're at and the the little things or big things that he's done. As we think about just this room, it's amazing to see how God is orchestrating each of your lives. As we think about the world and and the history, it's just who who can really adequately describe all that? So blessed are they who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Our activity matters. It's not just about thanking the Lord, but we thank him by, by observing justice and, and partnering with God in all of his ways. Then we get to the cry to Yahweh. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you save them, that I may look upon the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. This, of course, again, is 
is partly for a group that is in exile. They are apart from their home. In Israel, they're, they're in Babylon and scattered to various places. And so it is a cry to Yahweh for, for him to remember the sufferer. Remember the afflicted one and, and to save him. We'll revisit this at the end because we'll return right to this very idea. Central verse in this psalm is verse 6. This is where we really get into it. Both we and our fathers have sinned. We have committed iniquity and we have done wickedness. This is the basic confession. It is the declaration of sin that the current writer and his generation is taking on and saying, this has also been what our fathers have done. We have this generational cyclical sin that we're stuck in. And this psalm is a confession of that. It is an understanding of their history not just recounting the events, but understanding it in the context of a relationship with the living God. That requires what we call confession. That it requires us to go, man, we've fallen short. We've disobeyed. We haven't followed through with what we, we said we were going to do. And so this psalm is going to spend the next 40 verses in confession. Not just of their current sins, but really how those sins have been cyclical and generational for a thousand years. And so we're getting better at understanding our own family of origin issues and how our upbringing has affected us and impacted us. We're getting better at that, and that's a great thing. It's a great exercise, but we also still need to identify our own sinful response to that upbringing and how we have carried on sin in our current generation. And this meditation brings us to that realization which is uncomfortable and full of confrontation, but it is where the word of God is taking you and I today. Both we and our fathers have sinned. How have we sinned? The author is going to give nine recollections, nine stories in very summarized form. It is, it is pointing you back to the first couple books of the Bible, uh, and you can go read. They're mainly coming from the book of Numbers and Judges. You can go read those books on your own this afternoon. They're real quick, fun stuff to read. Uh, but that's where these stories are coming from, highlighting, again, summarizing the relationship with the Lord and what's happened. So I'm going to go through all nine, and I want to uh, point out some things, and what we're going to see as we go through Israel's past and their sin in these moments, what this psalm is wanting us to see is how we do the exact same thing. Israel's sin is our sin. And we can share this confession of verse 6 that both we and our forefathers have sinned. We're right in line with this. So the first story is in verse 7. Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. There's that word. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love, but rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. Yet he, that is God, saved them for his name's sake, that he might make known his mighty power. He rebuked the Red Sea, and it became dry. And he led them through the deep as though through a desert. And so he saved them from the hand of the foe and redeemed them from the power of the enemy. And the waters covered their adversaries, and not one of them was left. Then they believed his words and sang his praise. This has to do with the sin of unbelief. In Exodus 14 and 15, you can find this story that they experienced this great exodus from Egypt, one of the most powerful nations at that time, without having to fight a battle, and they got all kinds of things from them. They were totally set up as a people to be an actual nation, and they left miraculously after incredible miracles that Yahweh did. And the very first thing they do is when they get to another impossible situation is they fail to trust God, even though they just saw all the plagues, they were now stuck in this new impossible situation of the Red Sea, uncrossable on one side, and Pharaoh's army on the other side. And all they could do was freak out and panic and lose their trust in the Lord. How could God do all this and bring us to this situation, which is clearly impossible, we're just going to die right here. When in fact, that was God's design all the time, he wanted to take them to an impossible situation and show them who he really is. But in the midst of that, they didn't trust. How many of us have failed to trust God in specific situations? 
How, how many of us have blamed God for the situations rather than trust that he will care and know what he is doing? And yet in the midst of the lack of trust on Israel's side of things and even on our side, God still delivers us from those situations. But we fail to trust often. Verse 13, the next scene. You think, okay, they, they learned their lesson there, but they didn't. Verse 13, but they soon forgot his works again. And that sets up this cycle, that it is a forgetfulness in the people of Israel, forgetting specifically his works to redeem, and that he's with them, and that he's promising things, and he's fulfilling those promises. So they forgot his works again. They did not wait for his counsel. In other words, they didn't talk to him. But they had a wanton craving in the wilderness and put God to test in the desert. He gave them what they asked, but sent wasting disease among them. And so their sin wasn't without consequence. What this is, is this is a, a sin of discontent. You can find this story in Numbers 11. He's referring to a time where they were complaining about manna. Israelites, as they wandered through the desert, God fed them with bread every morning from heaven. And after a while, they got sick of that. No, oh, manna again. This stuff. Remember when Egypt, we had, we had meat. Remember that tri-tip we had that one time? Oh, that was so good. And they're like complaining to the Lord about their lack of meat. And they just assume God doesn't hear and God doesn't care. And so rather than talking to the Lord about that and saying, Lord, could you, man, just give us a nice steak every once in a while? They just complain and doubt. And they have this growing discontent about their relationship with the Lord and how he is handling things. How often have we done that in our relationship with the Lord? Discontent with his leadership in our lives. Discontent with where he's brought us and his lack of felt provision. We have indeed done that. And rather than simply coming and talking to the Lord about it, you know, wait for his counsel, they just complain. And so this sets up uh, the cycle, like I said, where they forget God's work. They, they fail to bring the past to recollection and have that dictate their perspective and understanding of what is happening currently. They only see what their own eyes and from a human perspective can see. This is why we have to keep thinking and remembering God's work in the past. It will help our perspective in the present and give us hope for the future. God still grants a request. And we get to the next scene, verse 16. This is a sin of jealousy. When men in the camp were jealous of Moses and Aaron, the Holy One of the Lord, the earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. Fire also broke out in their company, and the flame burned up the wicked. There's a situation, you can read about it, in uh, Numbers 16, where a whole group of people were jealous of Moses and Aaron and how they got to mediate between them and the Lord. And they said, well, why do they get to do that only? We're all priests. God announced that in Exodus 19 at, at Sinai. We could do this too. And they were jealous, and they wanted to overthrow Moses and Aaron. There was this rebellion, and, and they led people astray. And how God handled that is he had the rest of Israel separate from that rebellious group who were jealous, not of Yahweh's name, but of their own reputation and their own wanting to be a certain uh, status, maybe, or thinking that was what this was about. Israel separated from them, and the earth literally swallowed up that group. It opened up and swallowed them. And there was a, there was a smaller group that wasn't with them, and fire burned those people up. It's a sin of jealousy. How many of us have grumbled against our spiritual leaders or been jealous of their position and tried to create our own following? I mean, some churches have even been planted with that mindset. And churches have split, and we see it. Uh, in our country, and in our culture, Christians getting jealous of, of power and wanting certain things to go their certain way. We see that sin nowadays. It's not motivated by the glory of God, but by the glory of themselves. There's a sin of jealousy. Verse 19. They made a calf at Horeb, which is another name for Mount Sinai. So it's talking about this story in Exodus 32 where 
Moses goes up the mountain, and while they're waiting for Moses, they build this idol, and they begin to worship it. So they worship a metal image. They exchange the glory of God for an image of an ox that eats grass. How ridiculous does that sound? But that's the summary of Exodus 32. That is what happens. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. Therefore he said he would destroy them, had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. There's always a mediator in these situations. But here we have the sin of idolatry. And we sit there and we read that story in Exodus 32 and go, how could Israel do that? How could they really forget that tangible miracle after miracle? They're even getting manna at this point. How could they forget this? And yet how often have you and I turned to something else besides Yahweh for comfort, peace, and well-being? What are you turning to for peace or for joy or for stability in life? What are you turning to for contentment? Is it a relationship? A number on the bank statement? A job? A certain number on the scale? What are you turning to? You see, that's idolatry. And it happens all the time in our hearts. Our hearts are prone to that. And it happens specifically when we forget the Lord's work. And so this psalm is wanting to move us to recall and articulate and remember and speak about God's great work. Verse 24 through 27, the next scene has to do with fear. Then they, that is the people of Israel, despised the pleasant land, having no faith in his promise. They murmured in their tents and did not obey the voice of Yahweh. Therefore he raised his hand and swore to them that he would make them fall in the wilderness and would make their offspring fall among the nations, scattering them among the land. So that's found in Numbers 13 and 14. Israel's at the edge of the promised land. They've, they've gotten out of Egypt. They got the law and they're ready to take the land. They send spies to kind of figure out where they're going to go, what it's like, and the spies come back, all but two of them, scared and passionately against taking the land saying, Yahweh will not help us, we cannot do this, we should go back to Egypt. And a whole movement arose within Israel of heading back to Egypt. They were afraid. They saw how powerful the nations were in there. They saw the fortified cities, and they were afraid, and it led to disbelief. They even, the text says, despised the Lord himself. They were rebellious, and they were angry. Why would he bring us to this impossible situation? Rather than think through, man, he keeps on bringing us through to impossible situations, and then he delivers us. They just see it as an impossible situation, and this is the final straw. And there's fear. How often do we let our fears lead us rather than trust? How often is our fear dictating our response? How often are we led to trusting in something else besides the very promises of a faithful God? We have sinned in our fear. Verse 28, then they yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. It's a, that's another idol. And they ate sacrifices to the dead. They provoked Yahweh to anger with their deeds and a plague broke out among them. Then Phinehas stood up and intervened, and the plague was stayed, and that was counted to him as righteousness from generation to generation forever. This is a, uh, we'll call it apostasy. It's found in Numbers 25. Apostasy has to do with forsaking something and going a different way. And that's what's happened here. The people of Israel forsook Yahweh and the worship of him and turned to a different God. And they did that in a patterned way, and they took on that religion, they took on that culture, and those husbands and wives, and they learned from them. And it led them to do all kinds of uh, immoral things, all kinds of uh, terrible things started happening uh, within the camp of Israel because they were worshiping a false 
God. How often do we turn our backs on Jesus? How often do we know the right thing to do, but we don't follow through with it? Or we sit idly by while our close Christian brothers and sisters are falling away. You see, these people unhitched themselves from Yahweh and took on a different God. And many people are doing the same thing today, forsaking Jesus and going their own way. The sin of apostasy is alive and well in this generation. Verse 32 and 33, the next scene. This is good so far. Hopefully you feel greatly encouraged. (laughs) They angered him at the waters of Meribah, and it went ill with Moses on their account, for they made his spirit bitter. And he spoke rashly with his lips. That's a story uh, in Numbers 20, where the people were complaining about not having water. And they'd already gotten water a couple times, several times. And this was a new situation where, again, it was impossible. They were thirsty. And rather than talk to the Lord about it, they complained. And it angered Moses. He lost patience. And because of Moses' anger, Moses wasn't even allowed to enter the promised land based upon how he handled that moment. It was a messy situation. It's the basic sin of grumbling. Rather than ask God, they assumed death and lack of care repeatedly. How often have we doubted God's care in our lives sure of the fact that he is not caring for us and doesn't see us. We've been there. And we can look at the story of Israel and identify, be like, yeah, I'd be thirsty, I'd be starting complaining too. Kind of the final scene, the eighth one, there's one more after this, but this kind of is a general uh, summary of the book of Judges from verse 32 to 42. 34 to 42, and it talks about just this sin of drifting away. So it's not just a specific sin, but it has to do with this idea that this tendency to drift away. Verse 34, they did not destroy the peoples as Yahweh commanded them, but they mixed with the nations and learned to do as they did. So there was this command that as Israel entered the promised land, they were to destroy all the nations as a form of God's judgment upon those nations. They were disobedient, full of sin and destruction. Terrible practices, terrible sin going on, terrible destruction. And so God, how he was handling the judgment of that was to bring in the Israelites to remove those nations from the land and to set Israel up as a righteous nation to be a blessing to the world. But Israel didn't obey that direct command. They disobeyed and they mixed with the people and they were discipled then by those people rather than the Lord. They learned those ways rather than the ways of Yahweh. And so they served their idols, which became a snare to them, and they sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They poured out innocent blood and the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Thus they became unclean by their acts, and they played the whore in their deeds." Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people, and he abhorred his heritage, and he gave them into the hands of nations, so that those who hated them ruled over them. And their enemies oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their power. Drifting away. This summarizes the failure to carry out God's will. How often have we had seasons in our life where we drift away from Jesus, slowly making little decisions of disobedience, that leads to this tremendous distance between us and the Lord. Whether it's been a couple days or a couple months or a couple years, all of a sudden you wake up and you realize, where is God? I can't even see him anymore. We drift. It was so bad that God started, in the book of Judges, you can read about it, uh, God started doing these little exiles where nations would come in and take some Israelites out or rule over them and, and uh, were terrible to the people of Israel as a way of judgment. And then verse 43 through 46 kind of stands back and summarizes the whole story. Many times he delivered them, but they were rebellious in their purposes and were brought low 
through their iniquity. There's a summary of the cycle. So not only are there there's these specific sins, but each time the sins get worse and worse. And it doesn't get better and better as generations go. In fact, it gets worse and worse to where they're sacrificing their own kids to idols. And so they're brought low. They're brought low. And even though God delivers them many times, and even though they keep crying out to him in their moment of need, God delivers them, then repeat the cycle. Now when we are faced with this, as we look at that list, our normal response and rehearsal of sin in our own minds, which we do, we're very aware oftentimes of specific sins or how we've made a mess of things. And our normal response is to not stop there. We'll go one of two ways. The first way is we'll just ignore that list and pretend it doesn't exist. We'll suppress it. And we'll, we'll, look, we'll pretend that, that ah, that's not really that true. I'm, I'm really a, a, this way. Or the other thing is to over-rehearse the list and find yourself in a state continually of being unlovable and unsavable. So that all hope is lost. Even the Lord himself cannot save me from this moment. Those are typically the two responses that I've noticed in myself and I've noticed in many Christians uh, on response to our sin. And that is where we stop. Either ignoring or in a state of being unlovable and unsavable. Now the psalm doesn't stop in verse 43. It keeps going. And it doesn't go to either of those places, but walks us through a different way. Verse 44, nevertheless, in spite of this generational, cyclical mess of sin that they're stuck in and can't get out, no matter what, it's, no matter what miracle God brings and how dramatic it is, it just doesn't seem to matter. Nevertheless, we need more neverthelesses in our prayer life. He looked upon their distress, and when he heard their cry, for their sake he remembered his covenant and relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love, and he caused them to be, be pitied by all those who held them captive. God's patience and love does not run out. Amen? In the midst of deep sin, God is ready to still redeem. You see, all along the way, this isn't just a story about our cyclical mess of sin. It is about God continuing to do his work in the midst of the complicated, horrendous cycle that you and I are stuck in. And he is powerful to work and redeem. And so this psalm is not meant to put us in a place of ignorance or in a place of hiding and shame, even though that's where we go, that's what Adam and Eve did. We're very good at being here. It is meant to draw us into a deeper reflection of God's saving work and come back, back to crying out to him and to saying hallelujah. That's where the psalm goes. So verse 47. As this generation who's in exile looks at this history. They simply cry out to the Lord again, Save us, O Yahweh our God, and gather us from the nations. This is ultimately the end of, a, of our time with the Lord. This is where the conversation needs to go. This is the goal, especially in seasons of affliction. Save, Lord. He is bringing you and I to this realization all the time. And what a great realization it is. Israel finds itself experiencing the ultimate judgment for sin, exile from the land. And they knew it was because of disobedience. Many of them were hooked up in chains and walked hundreds of miles. Many were killed, taken, cities burned. Livelihoods were lost. And so what does this generation do? They cry out to the Lord. Because what else can we do? Amen? 
Now why? Why should God save them? This is a great line in the, in the second half of verse 47. Save us, Lord, and gather us. Why? So that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people say amen, which is to agree with these statements. And then it ends with hallelujah, which is the same way every book of the Psalms end. But it's that second half in verse 47 I think is key. They recognize, finally, that there's a deeper heart issue of worship and gratefulness. See, the key mistake of the past generations was a faulty repentance, and we have the same issue. We keep desiring a miracle because we're hating our circumstances more than we're hating the sin. And that is a huge thing that Psalms is trying to point out. Every time Israel got stuck is because they got to these circumstances and they didn't recognize their own responsibility in them. They just hated the circumstances and said, God, just deliver me from this. Save me from this. And never once did they even talk about their hearts or their sin. But now we have a new prayer here. And it's a great prayer to pray. Save me, O Lord. Why? So that I can finally worship and actually glorify your name rather than working for myself and building my own life and empire. Save me, O Lord, that I can finally have this heart change. Rescue my heart so I can really worship you, which is what I was created to do, and glory in the greatness of your name. And so we need God to show up and save in our lives, absolutely. The great thing is that he has. He showed up, and the greatest work that he did was to die on the cross and rise again. That was the work that he did to go after our specific heart problem that Psalm 106 draws out. That's what the message of the gospel is. It is not a message that will fix all of your circumstances and and keep you from any sort of affliction. It is a message that goes after the deepest parts of our hearts. That we are stuck in this mess and we need God to save us and Jesus Christ can save us from our sins and he will and he has. Amen? That's his great work. And that's why we cry out to him. And that's the purpose for crying out to him and receiving that salvation is not so that you can have some benefit even though you will get blessing upon blessing. The point is, is that we give glory to God. So let me just close with three quick questions and then we'll enter into a time of of worship. As I've just thought about this psalm, there's just three questions. First, what cyclical sin do you need to repent of? These are the deep ones. These are the ones that are kind of unnoticed. They're formed by habits. They're the things that are dictating that common response that you Man, I can't seem to get a hold of the anger. I can't, man, I'm struggling with patience. I'm struggling with consistency. There's the deeper cyclical sin that needs some work. And it takes work to root that out. It takes partnership with the Holy Spirit. Second, what can help you remember God? What can help remind us of God's work and love? Have you forgotten God's power to save And his loving works that do save. It's so easy to forget, isn't it? It's so easy. And we need to do things that help you remember. If it's a decoration in your house, something in your car, something on your keychain, something in your wallet. All kinds of things you can do to remember and and do new things that are like little remembrances of of God's work. When When you see him doing these little miracles in your life, man, do something to commemorate that. Talk about it. Worship the Lord in it. And third, are you meeting with the Lord? As we rehearse our lives, our story of sin, that has to, that has to point us to a meeting with the Lord. Where there's an honest, heartfelt conversation with him. And that's what we value highly as a group of Christians. We value that meeting. The goal of everything that we do is to establish a meeting with the Lord. 
It's the greatest thing you could ever do is to talk to him and meet with him. Christians are helping each other facilitate these meetings all the time because sometimes we forget and we need someone to come in and be like, hey, when's the last time you talked to the Lord about this? Oh, man. Why are you got to ask me that question? We've got to meet with the Lord about this stuff and, and talk to him about this. God is extraordinarily long-suffering and patient. We have to cry out to him and have the nevertheless moment in our prayers. So seek him. That's what the call to worship is at the beginning and the end. Seek the Lord. Think about his works. Be aggressive in your pursuit of Yahweh. 